Puffy might be the destination for anybody going nowhere. He's not wrong. Y'all are f Nobody surviving. Yes, the lawsuit that we have been covering and following, so much being revealed, you're not going to believe that somehow it is connected to Michael Jackson and his Remember when 50 Cent confirmed to TMZ that the 48-year-old rapper's production company, G-Unit Films and Television, is developing a documentary about the allegations against Combs? Fifth teased a snippet of the documentary on Instagram on Wednesday. In the clip, former Bad Boy Records rapper Mark Curry said Combs would spike bottles of Moe with a substance that would make women at nightclubs slippery. Curry alleged that Combs would tell his friends and associates not to drink from certain bottles. Well, it seems the truth is still being brought to light. For context, Diddy's recently lawsuit has taken a dramatic turn with Candace Owens stepping forward with startling revelations. According to her, there's a connection between Diddy's legal battle and Michael Jackson's death, a claim that's raising eyebrows and stirring speculation. While it might seem far-fetched at first glance, Owens is adamant about the link, and she's ready to unpack her reasoning. Let's delve into her perspective and how she's weaving this intriguing narrative. Conservative pundit Candace Owens has ignited a storm of controversy with her recent statements, alleging a connection between Diddy's ongoing law lawsuit and the tragic demise of pop legend Michael Jackson. Owens made these bold claims on her podcast, where she delved into the intricacies of Diddy's legal troubles and expressed concern over what she sees as a notable lack of media attention. According to Owens, there exists a significant correlation between Diddy's legal challenges and the enigmatic circumstances surrounding Michael Jackson's passing. This case is arguably bigger than the Jeffrey Epstein case, and yet the media is silent on it. Why? Owens questioned her social media followers terrifying to consider but Hollywood and our politicians are being blackmailed into compliance. Additionally, she highlighted the connection between the individual allegedly involved in concealing Diddy's son's role in a shooting incident and Michael Jackson's former head of security, who was present at the time of the pop icon's death. Owens posits that individuals of this nature might resort to drastic measures, including unaliving, to safeguard their interests. Clean up guy, Mr. Fahe Fahim Muhammad was also on the scene when Michael Jackson died. Furthermore, during her podcast, Owens outlined five pivotal insights gleaned from Diddy's recent lawsuit, positing that its ramifications could surpass even those of the infamous Jeffrey Epstein case. She also took to social media to voice her apprehensions, emphasizing the scant media attention directed towards Diddy's legal entanglements and hinting at potential implications for influential figures in both politics and Hollywood. The Diddy case is arguably bigger than the Jeffrey Epstein case, and yet the media is virtually silent on it, Owens tweeted along with a link to her podcast. That's because they are implicated. It is dark, but we now know that both politicians and celebrities are being blackmailed. Expanding on her claims, Owens reiterated her stance in the YouTube caption, suggesting that both the media and Hollywood have motives for suppressing coverage of the Combs lawsuits. She perceives a dark agenda at work, one geared towards shielding prominent individuals from public scrutiny and consequences. Despite provoking debate and skepticism, Owens' assertions bring attention to the intricate power dynamics within the entertainment industry and underscore the far-reaching implications of legal controversies involving influential figures. Something that we also saw in these docs is that these parties, at least a lot of them, In any case, Candace went as far as to link pop icon Michael Jackson's demise to Diddy. For context, Michael Jackson remains one of the most popular entertainers in living memory, and one of the most controversial. Having won the world over as a child star, he became an icon in his own right as an adult performer, with the release of such seminal albums as Off the Wall, Thriller, and Bad. But his career eventually became overshadowed by his personal life, which included eccentric behavior, reported addiction, and child abuse allegations that besmirched his image in his later years. Indeed, though he remained a constant presence in the tabloids, he failed to perform publicly at all during the last decade of his life. Despite living a turbulent life that often played out in public, Jackson's sudden death on June 25, 2009 was met with a wave of genuine shock. Within hours of Michael's death, Latoya Jackson reportedly descended upon her brother's home, frantically searching for the bags of cash she knew he kept there. And in a matter of days, their mother raced to court to fight for control of Michael's estate and custody of his three children. The kids had followed Jackson to the hospital in a blue Escalade, and the job of telling them that their father was dead fell to Michael's manager, Frank DeLeo, who had nearly fainted when a nurse broke the news to him. This was the Michael Jackson that the world knew and mocked, the crazy family 
family, the botched plastic surgeries, the two divorces, the charges of child SA, the financial woes that had left him an estimated $500 million in debt. But Michael had a different view. In his final days, he not only dreamed of a comeback, he worked as hard as he could to pull it off, maybe as hard as he ever had in his life. He wrote new songs, rehearsed hour after grueling hour to perfect the shows that would pay off his debts and mark his return to greatness, and planned every detail of his comeback tour, a massive spectacle that had already cost at least $25 million in pre-production alone. Jackson gave the tour its title, and the name said it all, This Is It. Jackson knew what people thought of him, and he was going to change their perceptions, just as he had so many times before. In the final months of his life, Jackson thought of nothing but the tour, and those whom he loved and trusted the most were sure that this was the moment he had been waiting for. This is real? Asked his friend Deepak Chopra, who spoke with Jackson often in the weeks before his death. You're coming back for real? For real, said Michael, laughing. The night before he died, Jackson ran through a six-hour dress rehearsal of his concert at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. More than a dozen people who witnessed the final rehearsal, from his promoter to his choreographer to his musicians, all agree on one thing. Jackson was better than he'd ever been. He popped, just like he had in his glory days singing and outdancing the young pros that surrounded him. He was so brilliant on stage, recalls his tour director, Kenny Ortega. I had goosebumps. Ken Ehrlich, who has produced the Grammy Awards for three decades, sat in the audience, awed. I turned to somebody and said, this is amazing. For so many years, I have watched Chris Brown and Justin Timberlake and Usher and the Backstreet Boys and En Vogue all imitate Michael Jackson. And now here we were this many years later, and he was going to do it again. I got chills, literally. The hairs on the back of my neck were raised. Those those are the moments you hope for. This is, it was to be the biggest comeback ever. Frank, Jackson told his manager, we've got to put on the greatest show on earth. The tragedy is, he almost pulled it off. On June 24, 2009, the day before Michael Jackson's untimely death, his final meal at home took place in the company of his family. Despite the forthcoming This Is It residency scheduled in London, rehearsals were conducted at the Staples Center in Los Angeles, conveniently located just a short drive from Jackson's residence on Carrollwood Drive. During this meal, Jackson shared the table with his children, Prince, Paris, and Blanket, all of whom resided with him. Catering to the nutritional needs of the Jackson family was their personal chef, Kai Chase, responsible for crafting health-conscious meals for the pop icon and his loved ones. In a recollection shared on on Larry King Live, Chase mentioned preparing three meals a day for Jackson, some of which he would carry to rehearsals for This Is It. Whether at home or on the go, Jackson consistently dined downstairs with his children, fostering a familial atmosphere around their shared meals. According to the Associated Press, Kai Chase, the personal chef for the Jackson family, stated that Michael Jackson's last meal with his children at their home consisted of seared ahi tuna paired with an organic salad. This culinary ensemble was complemented by a refreshing blend of carrot and orange juice. It's worth noting that some media outlets initially reported a different menu, suggesting Jackson had a chicken and spinach salad. However, these variations seem to stem from misinterpretations of Chase's broader recollections regarding the family's preferred meals. They had the chance to play with their cousins and, you know, they're having a great time. They look wonderful. They're happy. And I think it's a great decision. And seem very attached grandma. to their grandma. Yes, that's their grandmother. Contrary to some erroneous claims that Jackson's meal with his family was his final one, another witness contradicts this narrative. According to additional accounts, the star reportedly consumed another meal before heading to rehearsals on the fateful night that would become his last. The grandeur of This Is It was envisioned to be one of the most spectacular live stage shows ever conceived. According to Randall Sullivan's Untouchable, The Strange Life and Tragic Death of Michael Jackson, the the production not only aimed to showcase Michael Jackson's remarkable array of hits, but also promised a visual feast with extravagant set pieces and cutting-edge 3D effects. Amidst this spectacle, the audience anticipated Jackson to deliver a performance of unmatched brilliance, singing and dancing at a level he hadn't achieved in over a decade. Tragically, Jackson's journey to reclaim his former glory was hindered by chronic back pain, stemming from an onstage accident in 1997. This persistent discomfort led to his dependence on pain medication, impacting his sleep patterns at the time of, this is it. The responsibility for Jackson's health during this critical period was entrusted to Dr. Conrad Murray by the show's promoter, AEG Live. Dr. Murray, in turn, administered Prescription D to address the pop star's health challenges. Was, um, the most hidden treasure trove of his life is with me. But I have protected Michael up till now. 
Simultaneously, the production crew harbored concerns about Michael Jackson's apparent frailty, particularly given the demanding expectations placed on him. Recognizing the physical challenges of the arduous rehearsal schedule, there was a concerted effort to encourage Jackson to maintain a healthy diet to sustain his energy levels. According to Untouchable, one individual who closely collaborated with Jackson in those concluding days was Ed Alonzo, an accomplished magician tasked with orchestrating large-scale feats of magic for the show. Alonzo attested that on June 24th, just before rehearsals commenced at 9 p.m., he observed what might have been Jackson's last meal, chicken and broccoli. I've said nothing that this has been inflammatory about my friend. I have I protected Michael. You see, when I had to meet him at the house with a G official. The expectations placed on Michael Jackson to deliver sensational performances throughout his 50-night residency were monumental. While undoubtedly motivated to provide his fans with an unforgettable experience, reports indicated that the singer was facing significant financial challenges. Agreeing to the shows was seen as an opportunity to revitalize not only his career and reputation, but also his financial standing. Consequently, the early rehearsals proved to be demanding, with the king of pop grappling with poor health and inadequate sleep, causing concern among the production team. Despite the pain and suffering that I've encountered. Facing these challenges, Jackson was notably absent for several early rehearsals. As the opening night of This Is It in London loomed just a few weeks away by the end of June, the pressure intensified for things to fall into place, underscoring the urgency to overcome obstacles and present a triumphant performance. During the last rehearsal at the Los Angeles Staples Center, multiple witnesses, including Ed Alonzo, attested to its resounding success. Jackson appeared notably happier and healthier than in any preceding rehearsal, leaving a positive impression on the observers. The session extended until midnight and encompassed Jackson's complete repertoire of hits. As the night concluded, there was a collective conviction that they were moving in the right direction. Jackson expressed satisfaction and gratitude to the team, ending the evening on an optimistic note. However, fate took a tragic turn, marking the final appearance of the King of Pop before the team. Despite Michael Jackson's evident energy and enthusiasm during his final rehearsal, he grappled with issues at home, particularly related to sleep. Despite his genuine excitement about the quality of the This Is It performance, calming himself down proved challenging, as detailed in Untouchable. Nonetheless, he made an effort to go straight to bed, with Dr. Conrad Murray tasked with preparing medications aimed at aiding the overworked star in getting much-needed rest for his comeback residency. Between 1.30 a.m. and 3 a.m., Murray administered three different sedatives, Valium, Ativan, and Burst. Additional doses were given throughout the night as Jackson's insomnia persisted. Michael Jackson never mentioned a single doctor to me who was treating him with opioids, Propofol. Disturbingly, reports indicate that Michael Jackson's final request to Dr. Murray was for some milk. However, this seemingly innocent term concealed a more ominous reality. Untouchable reveals that milk was Jackson's nickname for Propofol, a medication to which he had developed a dependency due to chronic pain. Shockingly, Murray administered this substance at 10.40 a.m., marking a tragic turn of events in the life of the iconic performer. In an interview with the Associated Press, Kai Chase recounted the unsettling moment the following morning when she sensed that something was gravely amiss. I thought maybe Mr. Jackson is sleeping late, Chase said. I started preparing the lunch and then I looked at my cell phone and it was noon. About 12.05 or 12.10, Dr. Murray runs down the steps and screams, Go get Prince! He's screaming very loud. I run into the den where the kids are playing. Prince, Jackson's oldest son, runs to meet Dr. Murray, and from that point on, you could feel the energy in the house change. I walked into the hall and I saw the children there. The daughter was crying. I saw paramedics running up the stairs. Around lunchtime, Murray rushed down the stairs, urgently calling for Jackson's son, Prince. The situation escalated when paramedics arrived and hurried to Jackson's room, prompting the family to gather downstairs, where they initiated prayers. Chase, in a surreal turn of events, was asked to leave the house while Jackson was being transported to the hospital. Chase recalls, we were all praying, help Mr. Jackson be okay. Then everyone was very quiet. After administering Propofol to Michael Jackson and leaving him alone, Dr. Conrad Murray returned to discover that the iconic pop star was not breathing. Despite his efforts to resuscitate Jackson, who had experienced respiratory arrest, Murray was unsuccessful in reviving him. Upon stepping outside on that fateful day, Kai Chase observed a scene of urgency and distress. Ambulances occupied the courtyard, and a crowd had assembled. 
Chase, who had been hired by Jackson in March, experienced a unique journey with the pop star. Initially let go in May, she returned to Jackson's service on June 2nd. During her tenure, she noted that Jackson's primary focus was on maintaining a diet centered around fresh and healthy food, not only for himself but also for the children under his care. She said she prepared meals for the family and occasionally for Murray. She said Jackson was in training for his upcoming shows in London and told her, you have to take care of me. According to Kai Chase on typical days, Dr. Conrad Murray would bring Michael Jackson the specially prepared fruit juice drinks she crafted, accompanied by granola with almond milk. The pop star's lunch shared with the children featured a menu ranging from items like spinach salad to chicken. Sometimes Dr. Murray would join them for dinner, which might include dishes such as seared ahi tuna. Chase mentioned that the doctor would consult with her regarding the 50-year-old singer's dietary preferences, ensuring that he ate properly. To get Mr. Jackson's juices or some sort of breakfast for him for that morning. So around that time, I noticed I hadn't seen Dr. Murray. Despite the routine, the only peculiar aspect was the presence of oxygen tanks. Chase admitted to never inquiring about the purpose of the oxygen and emphasized that she noticed no indications of Jackson being on or experiencing declining health. Normally in the morning, he would bring oxygen tanks from upstairs downstairs, one in each hand, she said. Authorities conducted searches at Dr. Conrad Murray's Las Vegas home and medical office as part of an investigation, which also involved raids of his clinic and storage in Houston the previous week. Pending toxicology reports, investigators were operating on the theory that the potent anesthetic propofol may have played a role in causing Michael Jackson's heart to stop, as per a law enforcement official who spoke to the Associated Press. Murray reportedly informed investigators that he routinely administered the substances to help Jackson sleep, including on the early morning of June 25th. I do not spare myself. I am not a perfect man. The official, speaking anonymously due to the investigation, disclosed that Propofol is meant to be administered exclusively in monitored medical environments by trained personnel. Murray allegedly left the bedroom and returned to find the star unresponsive, marking a critical point in the unfolding events under investigation. The gravity of the situation ultimately led to Murray's legal troubles. Police have said Murray is cooperating and have not labeled him a suspect, and his lawyer Edward Chernoff has said the doctor didn't prescribe or administer or anything that should have K. Michael Jackson. Similar to Dr. Murray, Kai Chase revealed that she had been enlisted to join Michael Jackson for his comeback concerts in London. Interestingly, the request for her involvement came directly from Jackson's 12-year-old son, Prince Michael II. Prince said, Daddy wants me to tell you he wants you to go to London with us, she recalled. I said, tell your daddy that I'm pleased and honored. Having completed paperwork and submitted a copy of her passport to the Jackson staff, Kai Chase anticipated departing for London on July 3rd. However, on June 23rd, Jackson informed her, I'm packed and I'm ready to go. Sadly, just two days later, the pop icon passed away. This marked the end of what Chase described as her dream job and a picturesque period in her life. The journey began in March when Michael Williams, Jackson's assistant, contacted her. Initially unaware that the client was Jackson, she was informed that her services as a personal chef were requested. I couldn't believe it, she said. I asked him if I was on candid camera. I said, am I being punked? Kai Chase explained that Michael Jackson had reviewed her resume, which highlighted her experience cooking for Macy Gray and Jamie Foxx, along with catering a fundraiser for President Barack Obama. Jackson was also aware of her multiracial background and the fact that Red Fox was her godfather. However, before officially starting her role, Chase had to undergo approval from three additional individuals, the Jackson children. I came to the house and the first people I met were the kids. They started interviewing me, she said. They told me, we're into healthy eating. When they approved her, she went to work and we developed a really great bond. Most days, she said, Jackson made a point of having both lunch and dinner with the children. Prince, 11-year-old Paris, and seven-year-old Prince Michael II, known as Blanket. And each meal was preceded by Paris saying grace. After weeks of healthy food, she said she wrote Jackson a note with a suggestion. I said, what about doing comfort food Saturdays? We could do barbecued chicken and corn on the cob, maybe Mexican food or soul food. She said he loved the idea. But as the concerts approached, healthy eating returned full time. He said, I'm a dancer, and he wanted food that would not make him cramp up while he was dancing. So according to Candace Owens, when all this was happening, 
Fahim Mohammed, who has eerie connections with Sean P. Diddy, was present which has led people to think that Diddy may be potentially involved in Michael's death. Apparently, Fahim has also been mentioned in Diddy's lawsuits. According to Rodney Lil Rod Jones' lawsuit documents against P. Diddy, Fahim Mohammed, referred to as Mr. Mohammed, was the head of his security team. Mr. Mohammed had the power to make problems and people disappear. He also had connections within law enforcement. P. Diddy allegedly instructs his staff to always contact Mr. Muhammad if they are ever pulled over by the police in Miami or California. For context, the lawsuit alleges that Diddy and his son shot someone. After that shooting, the documents say explicitly that Mr. Muhammad spoke with the LAPD after G was shot at the recording studio. The LAPD was in the recording studio and witnessed the blood in the restroom, and they went with the bogus claim that the shooting of G occurred outside of the studio. This was all thanks to Mr. Muhammad's connections within law enforcement. So basically, they are supposed to call this guy, and he will make it disappear. Now, Ian Carroll, an independent journalist investigating everything that is going on, explains the connection that Fahim has with Michael Jackson. P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, has been running a blackmail operation very much like Jeffrey Epstein, but in the rap and music industry for basically 30 years. We learned that his head of security while he's running the sexual blackmail ring is this guy named Fahim Muhammad who before working for Diddy was the head of security for Michael Jackson. It may seem coincidental at first glance. Faham Muhammad, with his background in security, holds a significant position in the field. His involvement in providing security for Michael Jackson, coupled with the singers passing under his supervision, raises questions. Particularly, one wonders about Muhammad's qualifications, given the magnitude of his responsibility at just 21 years old. Who exactly is Faham Muhammad, and what credentials does he bring to the table? Looking into Ian Carroll's investigation sheds some light. In 2008, Faham graduated from Sacramento State University with a degree in business administration, specializing in real estate and marketing. The timeline, however, raises eyebrows. Michael Jackson's demise in 2009 coincides with Faham's recent college graduation prompting scrutiny into his suitability for such a crucial role in Jackson's security detail. Anyway, as more details unfold, fans are hoping that some light will be shed on the pop icon's unfortunate demise. But that's it for this video, folks. Bye.